Let's go back to the Brazil days. You grew up, there was a wrestling mat in your living room. One of the things that I love about the principles of Jiu Jitsu, it puts things into perspective and it's important that we are put in situations where our principles are questioned. And the thing is, we have to be brutally honest with ourselves. And that is the most painful part. I've experienced my highest highs and my lowest lows in this expedition. And it's the in-between that you're constantly navigating your connection with yourself, your connection with the mountain, your connection with your team, and your connection with your mission. Yeah, so we met a few weeks ago in Los Angeles and um, we were at a wellness event and you stood up and you talked about your school, your jujitsu school for, for girls and for women. And I was so intrigued by that concept. And you talked about summiting Mount Everest and using the principles that you teach to do that as a role model for the girls that you work with. So I did a deep dive into your story and I'm, I'm just, I'm super excited to, to unpack what all that means and, uh, and how you, how you kind of landed where you are today. Your last name is very familiar for people who don't even do jujitsu. I've never taken a jujitsu class, but obviously I've heard of Gracie and I associate that with, um, the, the art of jujitsu. And, um, so I guess that's a good place to start is just talking about the legacy, the Gracie legacy and, and where you sort of fit into all of that. Yeah, it's so interesting because I'm so honored to have been born into a legacy. Uh, my family is the largest fighting dynasty in the world, and it looks so huge when you hear from the outside. But within, you know, the way we grew up just, you know, felt normal until you kind of start interacting with the world and you see like, wow, it's really different what we're doing here. We're all connected into this mission. And that's not how, how all the other families operate, you know. I think when you think about a legacy, the most powerful thing into creating a legacy is connection. We're all connected into the same mission and it's not forced, but it's, it's appreciated, at least in my experience. So, you know, being a woman in a family where the men were predominantly the, the path builders in the first generations. And now, as you mentioned, I have a school for girls and women only, you know, it's the only Gracie Jiu Jitsu school in the world for girls and women. And it's been a transformational journey to really find my voice and just follow my passion without being concerned on how that would affect other people's perceptions and just using those principles and applying them in the places where I felt I needed it the most growing up. And there's so much to talk about, but my journey, you know, I left Brazil when I was a teenager, I moved to London and then I moved to Southeast Asia and I'm in the U.S. now, just experiencing multiple lives into one journey while having the same core beliefs and values that they were never shaken regardless of the environment I was in. I think that's, you know, one of the things that I'm the most grateful for having learned in within my family. And that's why I'm so passionate about sharing these principles, because it's not about making people, you know, turning people into fighters. It's about providing the tools so that you never allow the environment to change who you are within. Let's, let's go back to the Brazil days, right? You grew up, there was a, a was a wrestling mat in your living room. <laughs> so talk about that. Your, the place where you, you grew up, what was the vibe like in the house? Um, and, and also what was your mother's relationship like with, with jujitsu? The famous Gracie headquarters was in Teresopolis, which was like a mountain city, an hour and a half from Rio. And my family was huge. My grandfather had 21 children. So they needed a big house. They needed a lot of land. And when people hear that, they go, 21 kids living together in the same house? And I'm like, yeah, but that was on purpose. You know, my grandfather had that vision and he had the intention. I'm going to build a little army of light warriors to continue this, this legacy, you know, and if I have one or two kids, it's not going to create the same impact. So everybody lived together. 
my mom grew up in a much different environment than I did, but the the core of that childhood translated because our house was always full. We always had friends. We had, you know, dozens of cousins around and we've always been very close. So that culture, I think that's also embedded in Brazil. If we do everything together, you know, and in within my space, doing everything together meant, you know, the mats were the reference for problem solving. The mats were the reference for playfulness, for discovery, for curiosity. And a lot of it, you know, when you're growing up was so healthy because our body is such a huge instrument in our lives, just being present in our body, which, you know, you teach meditation. It's, you know, it's such a, an important part of bringing in that introspection and understanding what space to occupy, how are you feeling, and how is that going to affect everything else around you? We had that very clear at home, and it was a space where we welcomed every emotion. You're frustrated, you go to the mats, you let it out. You know, you're tired, and you get there, you start moving, you're energized. You know, you're bored, you go there, you're going to start playing. And we start crawling as fast as we start training. You know, we're learning how to fall forward, protect your faith. So, uh, play with your friends, like roll around, play with your cousins. I had two siblings at home and it was a neutral ground for, for kids to be in that you don't have to worry if you're going to break the furniture at home. And at the same time, you know, it, it's an incredible space for development. So your mom was one of 20, right? And there were six different mothers from what I understand. So was your, was your grandfather like, was he wealthy or was he just a ladies man? Like, how did he, how did he end up procreating with six different women? Was that a part of the culture back when he was coming up? What was the or origin of that? Yeah. My mom was one of the 21 and her mom, my grandmother was, you know, the, the wife that stayed with my grandfather for most of his life when he was, you know, creating impact with jujitsu and really focused on creating the headquarters. My grandmother was the one that lived there and sort of helped, you know, raise all of the other kids. She was his partner for life. And at the time, you know, one of the women that he was married to died of tuberculosis, you know, so he ended up having multiple partners, not all at the same time. He was always in monogamous relationships, which, you know, with my grandmother was a monogamous relationship as well. But because she was a mom and she had the last six children, you know, she really built that foundation, that space where everyone connected. And my grandfather was a little bit older at the time. He wasn't so hands-on with jujitsu. His younger sibling had taken over that role. And, you know, he was the coach for the family. He was representing jujitsu, structuring the, the programs, the trainings. And my mom was very close to my grandfather because at this age of his life, at this stage of his life, he dove deep into um, alternative medicine. So he actually, you know, he opened a clinic when he was 80 years old. He constantly reinvented himself. And every time he felt that his mission was accomplished in one area, he would, you know, happily pass the baton to somebody else and then do what he knew only he would do at the time. And he started a clinic and he treated people with medicinal herbs and he created the Gracie diet, which he spent the majority of you know, the, the last years of his life, the last few decades of his life researching because he realized, okay, for, you know, this, this clan to be successful, to be healthy, they need to be well. In order for them to represent the family to fight, they cannot get sick. You know, we schedule fights months ahead of time. They need to be prepared. So they need to be eating well. And he believed everything started from what you consumed. So he built the Gracie diet, which is, you know, split in seven different food groups and ultimately it's you know how you combine them for ultimate digestion because he believed every disease comes from acidity in the gut so if your digestion is not optimal you're not going to absorb the nutrients through your gut and then your immunity goes down and that's where cancer begins that's the source of every disease and that was his you know the work of his life and my mom worked with him in this clinic so when she was younger she was trained and all of the self-defense programs and they used her for demonstrations to show the efficiency and the importance of women to learn jujitsu. And they would go on national TV and she would show up, you know, wearing dresses and high heels. And then, you know, the family members would start attacking her a lot of times with multiple attackers. 
And she would be defending herself to bring awareness to women on how important it is to know those skills. And then she transitioned, she followed my grandfather everywhere and she transitioned into medicine and, and natural treatments and, you know, a life focused on health. So it was very inspiring to see. So Brazil is, is a very patriarchal mm -hmm. society. Did that translate to the Gracie family as well? Um, in terms of how women were expected to be in, in, within the family dynamic? Definitely. I think our family was a reflection of what society looked like at the time, you know, and realistically, women were um, raised to procreate and take care of the family. You know, women weren't in the workforce. Women weren't leading anything. They weren't heads of companies. They couldn't, you know, uh, open a bank account like they couldn't vote. And, you know, they say that my mom was like the, the prodigal daughter because they sent her to do high school in the U.S. You know, they really invested in her education and, you know, they put her in, in every single skill they thought it was important. My mom learned how to sing opera. My mom learned how to play the piano, how to play the guitar. She spoke six different languages. So they really invested in that. But there was no space in society for her to really put all those skills into use at the time. And in within the family, there was a cap on how far women would go in jiu-jitsu. So there was this division of it's mandatory for every woman, woman to learn self-defense. You need to know the whole curriculum. And then you stop right there. So if you showed up in the actual training sessions with the families, like, what are you doing here? No, go back home. You know, you're, you're not putting the gi and you're not training with the guys. But ultimately, it's interesting because that attitude came with the purest intention of we need to protect you. You can't be trained to compete and be thrown left and right because that's going to affect your reproductive system. And that could potentially lead you to not be able to you know, bear a life or to start a family and you're stealing the years that you should be investing in finding a husband. So for sure, there was, you know, an overlap of what is, you know, the expectations and culture on what women should behave like. And for my family to be teaching jujitsu and self-defense to women was already, you know, breaking a huge barrier, but that was as far as women would go. And that remained in multiple generations in my family, you know, and for, for decades, women didn't really participate until one of my cousins, really, Kira Gracie, she took on the role of, I want to do this for a living. And she had to fight in order to fight, you know, and she was the first uh, woman in the family to become a, a black belt. And she's highly responsible for me to be doing what I'm doing now, which, you know, it's so important. If you don't have a reference in the space, you don't think it's possible. You know, she literally showed me it's not only possible, but you will have one of the strongest voices if you choose to go on this path. It's not going to be easy, but once you create the space, because the challenges on the journey in order for you to create a space that's not there, that is not offered, the challenges are so big that everything you have to go through is constantly making you question your values, it's constantly making you question your decisions. And most importantly, it's challenging your conviction. How do you, how bad do you really want to do this? How much do you believe you are meant to be doing what you're doing? And if your convi conviction is not strong, you give up. But that sets out, you know, our, our patterns for everything. Do you have conviction in your whys and the things that you're doing or not? And having, you know, specific role models in my mother and Kira were really important for me to realize, yes, like, you should be doing this as well. Like, you'll, you'll make it, you know. Right. And I'm imagining this is a small town, right? There's a lot of reverence for your family in the world because when you came along, you have a worldwide brand. Uh, I don't know what the financial situation, but I'm imagining you guys are doing pretty well for yourselves. and uh, And so... When you would be out and about in town and going to school, did people sort of project some sort of, um, a, a, you were in a different category from everyone else because you have that last name or, or what was that? How did you, how did you sort of navigate that? I think the biggest concern was more, whoa, do not cross them. Oh. 
you know, there will be a hundred cousins that come in the background. So don't mess with them, you know, look the other ways. So I think it was more like, am I going to be single my whole life? Or is that a brave man out there who will step up? But uh, jokes aside, you know, I think it was, you know, a level of respect that came before you even introduced yourself. If they knew you were Grace, especially in Brazil, it was like, whoa, 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 you know, careful. Don't disrespect them. Don't do anything wrong. Maybe, yes, keep a little bit of a distance. And then on the other hand, it's like, wow, um, I want to associate myself with them. You know, like, so it was either a filter. If you had bad intentions, it would kind of keep you away. And if you, you know, really wanted to take part in this lifestyle, you would do everything you could to be a friend, to hang out. Like, wait, what? Like, you, you have watermelon juice for breakfast and like what is this thing that you're doing and you guys you don't have dinner you know you you have this whole different diet and you're all training and what does that look like and so it becomes you know just like everything there's positives and, and negatives attached to it and you know it was part of it, that identity was part of the reason why I decided to move to London you know and I was 17 when I made that move. And when I moved to London, it was the only part of my journey that I disassociated myself from my family. I did not set foot on the mats for four years. I didn't put a gi on. And I wouldn't tell anybody that I was a Gracie because it was so important to me, especially at that time, you know, you're really trying to build your identity. And I wanted to know, am I respected because of the Gracies? Am I respected because of who I am? Do I have, you know, a strong presence or do people, you know, move around me out of fear or, you know, can I hold, can I hold my own? And do I know how to set a boundary? Can I be safe? Can I find a job if nobody knows who I am, you know? And it was really interesting to see it was a completely different, you know, game. When I left, you know, that bubble, I realized how protected I was in Brazil and that being... Uh, a woman navigating the world alone was very different. Why did you choose um, London? So I had a cousin that was living there at the time. And the plan was just come, you know, spend six months here. It's going to open up your problems. Well, only were the worlds. That's not like, that was the only yeah. place you had a cousin. <laughs> the reason why we have money is because we don't pay for hotels. You know, you, you keep saving, you travel, you already automatically have a place to stay. Um, so when I moved to London, initially was, you know, you know, was a trip planned for six months, but it was interesting because as an underage girl, I needed both of my parents authorization to travel. They had to sign a document telling me, you know, she's authorized to fly alone. And my dad just wouldn't sign it, you know, and I worked so hard to save money. My dad was a refugee from World War II. He's from Italy. And he moved to Brazil. He had a really hard upbringing. So he always made us know the value of money. He invested in education, but everything else was like, you have to work for it. So I actually started working at six years old. I started stamping all his business cards and then he would give me money. You know, there was never like, oh, this is your allowance. You had to work for your allowance. You want to buy anything, you have to work for your money, you know, so do men who marry into the Gracie family have to take up jujitsu or not necessarily? Yeah, my dad is a red belt. <laughs> Where do they went to your meet? Oh, I think yeah. it's good to know. Cool. For their own safety, I think they can always True. sleep, you know, well at night if they go like, you know what? I better know at least how to get out of a choke, you know? <laughs> so they learn defense first and then they fall in love with the journey. No, but it's yeah. it's just, you know. Uh, if you live through jujitsu, it's such a big part of your life and you just see anyone that is around us sees the benefits, you know, so you can't help but want to take that step. Like you can't help but learn, you know. It's the whole thing. If you hang out in the barbershop for long enough, eventually you're going to be like, I'll, I'll get a haircut. You know? yeah. If you're around the Gracie's long enough, you're going to be like, okay, I'll get it. I'll yeah. get my gi and get on the mat. Yeah, and the longer it takes you to get the haircut at the barbershop and the longer your hair looks, you know, the higher the discrepancy between everyone else at the barbershop. So if you want to hang around with them long enough, you at least one haircut you're going to have to get, right? It's like at least one lesson. 
And it, it's just, it's because I think a bit misconception sometimes is, oh, jiu-jitsu is a fighting style. And I don't want to fight, so I'm not going to take it. You know, there's no reason for me to do jiu-jitsu. But the reason my, why my grandfather fell in love with jiu-jitsu was because he realized this is a tool for self-development. And he believed in his core, talking about conviction. He was convicted that what jiu-jitsu did for him, if every single person joined that practice, it would completely reshape society. He believed that we would live in a more peaceful and more respectful and loving society if everyone, you know, took at least the introductory course in jiu-jitsu. And that is my biggest motivation is to follow exactly this aspect of his experience because it was mine as well. And it takes so much courage to be loving. It takes so much courage to be kind. You know, it, it takes so much courage to have self-control and all these things that you learn on the mats because all the mats are is just one, it's, it's a leveler of forces and it's an equalizer of emotions. So when you talk about your emotional elasticity, that's what jujitsu gives you. It gives you that grounding for you to find self-control, for you to find the courage in the moments that you need, you know, to constantly be strengthening your mindset. It's humbly, you know, if you're having a bad day, you're going to let out your frustrations on the mat. You're going to experience every single human emotion from pride to love, to joy, to community, to frustration, to anger. And it's how you override those emotions. Because if you're feeling frustrated with, you know, a person on top of you that weighs 100 pounds more than you, you just can't get out. So you have to breathe. You know, you've, you've both agreed to be in that specific scenarios so you can't just go like oh i'm out of here and by learning how to process that emotion and seeing that it's never as bad as it seems you know very few things are actually as bad as we portray them so when it comes to anxiety to depression to how we handle those emotions it's more a matter of how do you keep those emotions running in your body and how do you deal with the highs and lows that we experience multiple times a day and you're so excited about something and then that thing gets canceled well how do you deal with disappointment? Do you let that ruin your day or do you keep strengthening your mindset to understand, okay, let's find that leveler of emotions here and let's try to find that balance. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions and look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. You're alluding to these principles of jujitsu that you had some very tangible experiences with in London, even though you hadn't gotten onto the mat, but you had a few encounters um, with, with men that um, made you realize actually, um, the biggest jujitsu is, is not physical. It's, it's, it's in foundational, it's, it's in proximity, it's in connection. So let's talk a little bit about some of those experiences and the learnings that you, you took away from those. Definitely. Every woman listening to this podcast, they either personally experienced some kind of harassment or they know somebody who has. Statistically speaking, every single woman has been through a situation where they were harassed or that their best friend was harassed and they didn't know what to do. Unfortunately, those are the moments where the majority of people have an awakening like, oh, wow, I actually don't know what to do. And then they go seek for tools to handle those situations. If we could expose ourselves to the principles that allow us to anticipate and prevent those situations, life would be much better. And those statistics would be impacted a lot faster. And when we talk about teaching you how to fight, it's so that you never have to. But the impacts that knowing and understanding these principles will actually impact your relationships, they'll impact your connection with yourself, they'll impact how you navigate the world. So. My favorite principle, and to me, the most important, which is the first one is foundation, you know? And even if you never take a jujitsu lesson in your life, you can take the principles with you 
And you can even say, yeah, I actually, I, I practice jujitsu in my life and I will practice jujitsu on the mat soon. But foundation in fighting means that no move will work unless you have a strong foundation. It's that base. It's, it's the base of that pyramid, right? And a pyramid can stand if the base is not there. And our lives is the same. And when you think about in jujitsu, every single move needs to stem out of that strong foundation. Otherwise, it's ineffective. It's, that's the thing about jujitsu. It's very black and white. There is no gray zone where you're unsure, where you're indecisive, where, you know, it is what it is. And it's proven. If you don't have a strong foundation, you will be ineffective. It doesn't work. It doesn't matter what you say. When you have to prove it, nothing works without a strong foundation. And it's the same in life. We just don't realize it. If you don't have a strong foundation as a leader, you have a responsibility of building a foundation that sustains your growth while supporting the people around you. As a leader in your family, in a company, it doesn't matter. You have that responsibility as a woman or as a man. And before you build a foundation for others, you need to build a foundation that's stemming out of you. And our foundation is everything. So your relationships and like real deep, meaningful relationships need a strong foundation because otherwise when, you know, there is disagreements, when there is third parties involved, when there is interference or drama from other people, then that relationship crumbles. So if you don't understand why are my relationships not lasting, why am I always falling, falling into those, you know, repetitive cycles, it's because your foundation is weak. Why is my business, you know, why don't I have courage to start my business? Why well, you haven't built a strong foundation where you trust yourself so much to take that step because every step needs to come out of that base. And what's once, an example of someone who creates a, a strong foundation? Like what's what's like an action step for doing that? It's the small steps that you take every day. You can't build a foundation in a day. So when we talk about the principles of building a foundation, then what are all the things that fall into this? It's consistency, it's commitment, it's, you know, self-belief, it's all these things, it's time. You need to know that nobody can build a foundation for you. They can't. Nobody can build a foundation and then say, hey, you know, now you have a strong ground to stand on. It's the meditation. It's like if someone wants to get healthier, but they're not sleeping at night, so they have no foundation of rest, which means their digestive system is not, they can eat the best food in the world, but their digestive system is going to be off. Their immune system is going to be off. Their hormonal balancing system will be off. So if you, if you uh, optimize your rest, that could be your foundation for then building upon that with better health. Exactly. Yeah. If, if you don't sleep well, your calorie intake is on an imbalance because then it requires more calories for you to operate throughout the day. So the foundation of sleep is important. And you know, when you think about your foundation, it is very individual. So my invitation for everyone joining this conversation is think about your foundation, your relationships, your health, your spiritual connection, whatever it is, your beliefs, you know, and your, your daily habits on all of those things, your career or your purpose or how you spend your time, whether it's volunteering, whether it's, you know, starting a nonprofit, whether it's creating your own company, whether it's working for another company, how is your foundation sustaining that? Because otherwise, it, it will eventually crumble. It's, it's just a matter of time, right? And, and a parallel I like to make because the reason why I decided to climb Mount Everest was to put those principles to test in the most extreme environment in the world. Let me see if my foundation is strong enough that can hold me in the most extreme environment in the world. And that foundation is my self-talk. So you have to decide what do I, what part of my foundation am I, you know, crumbling down? Because if your health, if your health is suffering, your company is going to suffer, your relationships are going to suffer because you're going to be either irritated or you're going to be out of your center. So your foundation is going to sustain everything in life and because everything that you build will come out of that foundation. So once you establish a foundation, then we start talking about connection. You know, you need to connect the dots in order to build things, because if everything is isolated, you're not building anything, you're just spreading things around. And so many people take so many steps in life, they're completely disconnected from each other. So they never get anywhere and then they become frustrated. So if you're trying to connect the dots, go back to your foundation, you know, because your foundation is the thing that is going to sustain your growth. So when we talk about connection, it's, it starts with your connection with yourself. 
So then it affects your connection with others, you know. In order to build meaningful relationships, in order to build strong teams, whatever your focus is in life right now, if there is a disconnect, there's going to be a negative impact. I don't know if you agree with that, but, you know, in, in my personal experience, every time I had fights in my relationships, every time I became frustrated, I thought about closing my business or something, I was disconnected from why I was doing that in the first place. And I was starting to worry about things that had less meaning than why I started that, that had less meaning why I was in that relationship, that had less meaning why, you know, I decided to go in this expedition because then we start getting overwhelmed by the details. So you become disconnected from the reason why you started in the first place. You become disconnected from your foundation. That, that's what's interesting about relationships is, and I, I'm, I'm positive, I don't know you that well, but I'm positive you had this experience because you're a teacher and a part of teaching is walking your talk. It's doing the things that you're teaching, right? And you're teaching empowerment. So if you're in a relationship that for whatever reason disempowers you, it's hard to be in that relationship. And if you stay in the relationship, it disconnects you from your mission, which internally makes you just feel like you're an imposter when you're out there actually teaching people. So either the relationship has to change or it's not possible for you to continue doing the things that you're trying to do for your mission. That's been my experience. Absolutely. And that's with everything. It's with everything. That's why it's so important to have few and clear principles in life. Like you need to take the time to do that. And that's the, the self, you know, the individual journey, because it doesn't matter how many people you have in life. We are all the journey is individual and we, we need support. You know, we need community, but the journey is individual. You have to show up as yourself. If you're trying to show up as the self that you think other people would expect or like that that's not going to last or, you know, that that's going to have terrible impact on you, on your health, on your mental health, on your physical health. And, and those are the things that I love about the principles of jiu-jitsu. It just, it constantly helps me become a better human being. You know, it puts things into perspective and it allows me to conquer massive challenges. And it allows me to realize when I conquer those massive challenges, that the biggest challenges are every day. The biggest challenges that I have are with the five-year-olds on the mats that just like you said, they keep you very honest, you know, and, and it is, it, you know, it, it's, you're trying to educate your kids at home and you're screaming at them, telling them to stop screaming. They won't hear you because your example is too loud, right? So I think it's, there's so many moments where it's important that we are put in situations where our principles are questioned. Yeah, so. you talk about these invisible rules that you had even when you were climbing Everest. So we're going to get to that, but let's finish up the principles. And I still want to talk about what happened in London with those guys, those creepy guys that made you sort of embody this stuff. Yeah. So um, uh, let's call it leverage so we, we keep it fresh. But so once you have a strong foundation, you can start creating connections. That's when you can apply leverage. So leverage is applied by you managing the distance with the people, the circumstances, and the decisions you make in life. So whoever controls the distance in jujitsu controls the damage. It's the same in life. Think about that. If people can't get to you, they can't hurt you. If you don't read those hateful comments on social media, they can't hurt you. But if you read them, they're going to shift how you feel inside. You're literally going to have to do work. You're going to have to go breathe, meditate, you know, uplift yourself again, and then take yourself out in the world because it shifts your internal state, right? And if, you know, if you want to cause an impact and if you're at a distance, if you're disconnected, you can't. So whoever controls the distance controls the damage. But I like to say on the positive side as well, whoever controls the distance controls the impact. And you are the agent who has the power to control the distance in your life. And by controlling the distance, you're constantly controlling, the, you're mi minimizing the damage that can happen and you're maximizing the impact that you can cause. And you don't need to be on the max in order to understand that principle and start applying, but you do need to write it down. You need to work on it, remind yourself, okay, I'm gonna focus this week on controlling the distance. Who are the people that I have proximity, but I never feel close to? 
That's where your work begins because that's a gray zone. There might be people that have been in your life for 10 years that somehow you don't feel connected. And you always think it's something wrong with you. You're like, I don't know. Like, I don't know why I can't. Like, there's something about them that I can't read or that I don't, I don't feel connected to them. And I've known them for a while. And they can work with you, you know, or they can be a friend. But you always feel like lean into that. So those are the situations, all the gray zones in your life, lean into them because you will get your answer. If you're with somebody- How do you do that? How do you lean into it? Let's say, let's say I haven't spoken with my brother in two years or my dad, right? How do I, how, how do you suggest leaning into that? This is just a hypothetical. I, I have a great relationship with my lead truth. You lead with truth. So it takes courage. You show up. Right. So you show up and you close the distance. If that by, person by, not not by projecting onto them like you're not da, 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 it's, I don't feel comfortable with how we're relating to each other. I would love to work on this if you're open to that. Is that what yes. you're Definitely. If it's a relationship that you think it's worth trying to keep around, you have to lean in. And then you can't do the work for the other person, but you can be the courageous person that will pick up the phone and say, Hey. I feel like, let's say if it's, you know, my sister, hey, I feel like the last few years we have been drifting more and more apart from each other. And I always feel like I'm either walking on eggshells or I don't know where you really stand. And, you know, I even feel sometimes, should I even tell her that I accomplished this thing or is she going to be envious of me? And I don't want to have these questions in my mind because for me, blood is the most powerful thing. And I think it's important that we stay together and that we do the work to actually strengthen our bonds because our bonds are feeling like they're, you know, hanging by a thread. You're going to see what's on the other side. Either she'll say like, oh, don't start with your drama all over again. Then they're not willing to do the work, right? So, so if their response is immediate, like, oh, I just, I can't, I don't have time for this right now. Like my, just, uh, you, you're trying to get attention. If you're speaking from your heart and you're telling somebody, you know, just go right in. And if it's family, I think it's important that you're that truthful, you know, but if it's with a friend, you try to get close together, make one-on-one -on -one time. I think, you know, when you remove all of the other distractions and if it's, you know, a friend that every time you're with them, you're kind of hanging out with a group and you always, you have these questions in your mind, but they're always around. Ask to have lunch with them. It doesn't need to be that deep. You don't have to, you know, I think it's, if, if it's family, you need to be direct. And because it's been going on for a while, they've been around you for a while. And then the only way to, make a change and lean in is if you put your heart on the table and you're like, and you're willing to take the stab or you're willing to connect and then you'll know, but then at least you can move on without getting all of the energy sucked out of you because you're saying so much in your head about like, Oh, you know, you, cause it's always in the back of your head. That gray zone takes so much space inside of us because the, the green zone is clean. I know where I stand with this person. I know I can pick up the phone and call them at any time, or I know I need to keep a distance. So yeah, I'm willing to go have dinner, but I'm not willing to host them in my house. So if they call me and ask me, Hey, I'm, I'm passing by town. Like, can I spend the weekend with you? Then, you know, the answer is no, but what creates resentment and what affects our health also is when we say yes, when we want to say no. And we do that because we're in that gray zone. So we don't know how to navigate. We're always like, oh, shh, but what do I do? But if I say this, they're going to think that. And then they're going to be mad at me. Well, then have it very clear. This is a person that I'm going to keep a distance. Or this is a person that I'm going to lean all in. So I think that connection like that is important at work. You know, and we make so many assumptions. When you make a decision to go all in or all out, there are no more assumptions. Things are clear. Path is clear. Move on. You know, next. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So how did this apply to the London situations? The restaurant how, tour that blocked you and yes, pull you in his car. Yeah. So I have a 17 year old girl, you know, living in another country. I now have this awareness that it's very clear and not from there, right? You're walking on the streets, like looking at everything, like, wow, taking photos of buildings. It's like, it's definitely her first time on the street, right? You know? Um, you're looking at reading the ingredients, you're lost in the supermarket. It's important for women, important for women to also have this awareness. If you're traveling somewhere that you've never been, you look like this. When you go into, you know, the store to maybe you just want to buy a product, 
whoever is observing you clearly knows that you're not from there. Because think about your everyday store. You know exactly where everything is. You go in, you're like, I'm just going to get these three items. Boom, boom, boom. In five seconds, you're out of the shop. And if you're in a place that you're not familiar with, getting one item can take you 25 minutes. You have no idea where it is. Your whole work's here. What does their uniform look like? You have that look in your face that you're an outsider. And that is detectable. And in the world that we live in, people are always looking for the path of least resistance, you know, which is what is the easiest victim here? So, yeah, I had several situations in London because I clearly looked like I was not from there and I was fresh off the plane. And, you know, so I had people follow me in supermarkets. I had people, you know, try to get me in cars and drag me in cars and uh, at work, I had managers block me in the changing room when I was closing out restaurants and several situations. And, you know, again, every woman listening to this has been through one situation or another. They have been grabbed. They have, you know, been put in scenarios where they felt vulnerable and scared. And in none of those situations, I, you know, the outcome was me putting that person in a rear naked choke and putting them to sleep and going home. You know, some of them I had to use my body. You know, when I was grabbed by the wrist, I needed to know how to escape, how to get my wrist out. But those things are three second situations. You know, the most important thing is that you're aware that somebody's, you know, noticing you, you're aware that your posture now became a little hunched. So get back into that posture of a champion and you know, make yourself bigger. Women, take up space. You're not taking up someone else's space. Take up your space proudly. That is the best line of defense. You're already going to, you know, be portrayed in the world as someone who stands with confidence, as someone who will put up a fight. And then most importantly, use your voice. So when we talk about foundation, your foundation is your awareness. That is number one. Your connection is your posture, is your connection with yourself, how you carry yourself through the world. And your leverage is use your voice, stand up for yourself. You know, don't make yourself small, don't hide, don't freeze. But in order to do that, you need to be practicing every day. Yeah. Yeah, because they talk about you don't, you don't rise to the level of your ambition. You fall to the level of your training. And, um, yeah. and I've, had to, I've had to learn that over the years because I've traveled all throughout the world and people will ask me, you know, is it safe in such and such country? And I go, yeah, it's completely safe. And it's kind of like the, the great white shark saying it's safe in the water. It's like nothing's going to really come up to the great white shark. But the seal is like, oh, my God, this is the most dangerous place. I can barely relax without somebody trying to eat me. And so the male reality a lot of times is very different from the female reality. And, you know, it's like it could be like the walking dead where these guys just come out of the woodwork and they try to, you know, pull you into these little dark corners. So it's interesting. Yeah. And I'll give you a statistic because definitely, you know, we're talking about physical safety, self-defense, like dangerous scenarios for women in the world. And that is 100% accurate. Men don't have the same understanding of what women go through because men are not going through these situations. A six foot three strong you know, 200 pound full of muscle man like you is not having somebody grab them by the wrist and go like, oh, come in this car because we might traffic you or God knows where you're going to end up, you know. But women have to be aware, especially if you're alone. I was, you know, 17 modeling. I was very skinny. I didn't have a pound of muscle in my body at the time, you know, and I looked vulnerable. And that's even what my understanding of I want to be stronger. Like I want to feel stronger, not to intimidate other people. I want to feel in my body I'm strong and capable if I have to. You know, there's no better feeling in the world when you feel that you have, you know, control of your body through, like, if you need to explode, if you need to run, if you need to lift, if, like, you're capable. And that is something that you can feel capable in your mind, but your body will know, like, ooh, don't count on us. Even if it's subconscious, your body's talking to you the whole time, you know? So I am strong over skinny all day long. And when it comes to the applications of these principles outside of self-defense, they're equally important because, you know, men, they apply for jobs that they qualify 40% to the prerequisites, 
women only apply for jobs that they qualify 100% of the prerequisites. In most cases, men get the job. So wait, how come men who are 40% qualified is getting the job of women who are 100%? Because the women who are 100% qualified, they're not even applying. And if they apply, they walk in with no confidence. And nobody is, you know, nobody can read your mind. So unless you come in with a strong foundation, with your posture, with your voice, and you show that you're prepared for that, then you never get what you want. And that is the most important thing that I urge women to, you know, find some practice that brings them confidence, not just balance, not just enlightenment, confidence. We need confidence to navigate this world. You know, we are a species that is dominant, you know, there is competition in the world and the competition is not with you being better than others. The competition is with you being braver than you were yesterday. Like, because there must be the worst regret in the world is, you know, as the years go by, you don't know what you're fully capable of because you never even tried because you didn't have the courage to try. And yes, those principles are extremely important for safety for us to navigate the world, but because those things are the things that bring us joy, that bring experience, you're not gonna fully experience the world unless you feel capable, strong in your body, unless you have some skills to be safe, you know? And then when it comes to building your career, building your family, finding a partner that respects you, like it, 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 your confidence is, is connected to your self-worth, to your self-esteem. And 80% of women report having low self-esteem. Men are not reporting that at such high levels, you know, so it is all connected. And that's why I'm so passionate about this work with women. Definitely, you know, my experiences as a teenager in London brought my awareness on how important this work is, how, you know, every woman should learn these skills and every other decision that I made in my life, in my career and my adventures, it stemmed out of, you know, the confidence that I built from those principles, from knowing, yes. I have what it takes. And most importantly, I deserve to be here. I feel like a lot of what you're saying in terms of confidence is also tied to, yes, your ability to protect yourself. Yes, your posture and taking up space. And, but really what it, it, it ties to is your ability to adapt to change, knowing that you can adapt to whatever changes life throws at you. What, what is what can breed confidence, right? Because even if somebody, um, for whatever reason, didn't feel drawn to jujitsu or mixed martial arts or something like that. I mean, that's one of the things that I talk about in meditation, which is th the fact that meditation gives you the ability to adapt to change. And a part of that could be, hey, I'm very physically weak. I'm very physically imbalanced. I would like to learn more uh, how to get more strength, how to cultivate more of that balance. And so that could be that person's path. And someone else, like I remember when I was in my 30s, I didn't know how to swim. Not all the jujitsu in the world would not have taught me how to, sw to swim, right? You still have to learn these skills. And I felt drawn to do that after a very humiliating, embarrassing incident, which we won't get into today. But um, but yeah, just kind of learning how to adapt to changes that are, to use your terminology, that are in proximity to where we are. So obviously, if you live in a beach town, learning how to swim is going to make you as confident as a lot of the surfer people, you know, walking around. And if you live in a mountain town, you know, learning stamina and endurance is going to make you more confident. And if you live, you know, wherever you live, learning more about how to navigate that space is going to breed confidence. And so you ended up traveling to Southeast Asia and then to the United States. And then somewhere along the line, you met some young girl who helped you find your true purpose, which is harnessing those principles of, of BJJ for everyday empowerment. So I would love to hear more about that experience. So you met this young girl. What were those circumstances? Yes, so I met a few young girls <laughs> because life doesn't give us just one reminder they keep knocking on our door until we listen right but um i'll tell you two of them who were very impactful for me one was a girl that was suffering bullying a lot of bullying in school and the mom kept asking me to teach her and i kept referring her to other jujitsu schools 
And the mom would come back and say she hated it. You know, I really want her to learn from a woman. Like, I really want her to have a female instructor. I want her to have a powerful female role model in that space because she walks in and it's mostly boys. And, you know, the coach put her to roll with another boy that was much bigger than her in her first class. And she didn't want to go back. And, and I kept saying no and no and no until one day she brought the daughter for me to meet. And when I looked at that girl, I was just immediately transported within. Like my heart just like, it shrunk and expanded all at the same time. I still don't even know how to describe that feeling because like it got so small, but so big and, and like I couldn't breathe, but I also took the biggest breath of my life because I was looking through the eyes of a girl that was looking at me needing so much of all the things that I had to offer and I was refusing to show up for her without even knowing her you know it was a very um profound experience to look at her and realize that she didn't know that all of these things were going through my mind but internally I was thinking what am I doing with my life when you know it's so clear right in front of me that this girl just needs me to like stand a hand and then let's get moving girl let's get you strong let's get you confident let's speak up look at people in the eye let's get those shoulders back heart to the sky you're a champion you know because ultimately what really touched me was seeing a six-year-old crumbling on the inside because ultimately what jujitsu does it allows you to stand on the inside all these principles we're talking about all these tools all these skills that can be applied anywhere because they make you stand on the inside. And when you stand on the inside, that changes you. And when you change, your circumstances change. And I saw in front of my eyes that I could change the circumstances of that girl probably in 20 minutes on the mats with her. She would get it. And that's the thing about kids. They get it. So, you know, that was a really impactful situation that made me open up a small window in my life. I was still reluctant because I was working with, you know, uh, TV production, TV hosting. I was covering Olympic games. I was like, I had agents. I was super busy in that department. And I had decided to move away from jujitsu. And on that day, I was like, I'll teach you a private class on Sundays, you know? And ultimately that led to another class on Saturdays and word of mouth. And before I knew it, I was working every day of the week. And, you know, th there were other things in the process that made me change the direction of where I was going and to put more time and focus into that. But, you know, to this day, just multiple lives every day, you know, cross paths with me and share how much that has impacted them. Uh, I had one student also, she was born without any of the fingers in her hand. And she's so beautiful. She's Canadian with green eyes. And same thing, she was suffering so much bullying in school. And the mom heard about me and reached out and brought her for a class. And she just wouldn't look up. I couldn't hear her voice. She came in, she was like hiding behind her mom's legs, wouldn't make eye contact. You know, I, what's your name, champion? I couldn't hear her voice. She tried to pronounce her voice. I was like, wow, I can't hear her voice. You know, she shut herself down so deeply that her voice doesn't come out of her mouth. Now imagine if she's ever in a situation that she needs to speak up. She won't be able to, you know, and seeing that girl and seeing her potential and knowing there are two ways that her lives can go and they're very different. And one way is if she understands her power and her possibility that she uses them, and the other one is if she continues believing that she's a victim navigating the world. And those two directions that are so far apart come from like one single decision to, you know, dedicate some time to this girl and help her out or to say, I'm, I'm too busy, you know, but good luck. You're going to find somebody else. Well, that somebody else sometimes never comes. Look in your life. You know, you can pinpoint the people that came in pivotal moments. They're like, wow, that made all the difference. And I think that's where my focus shifted on being on myself and my career and the next project into who's the next student that's going to walk through this door. And I was still, you know, asking myself that question every day. I'm sure starting a center is a very heavy lift, right? Like you're in LA, you said things are going pretty well for you. Um, 
what was the thing that really got you to say, okay, I'm going to establish something like permanent that I could have some consistency with. And as a part of the family, is that they just sit, email you the playbook or do you have to kind of figure it out for each market or how does it work? You figure it out for yourself. You know, everyone has their own franchise. Everyone has their own business. Everyone operates differently. Everyone has their own, you know, uh, practice and beliefs. And it's, it's a very individual choice on how you want to show up. Some people are focused on competition. Some people are focused on self-defense. Some people are focused on only teaching seminars. Some people are focused in having franchises. Some people operate their own schools. For me, when I moved to the U.S., I opened my first jiu-jitsu school with my brother. And, you know, it was all our wealth on boys, girls, women, men. And we ran that for about two years. We sold the franchise. And that's when I moved into production, entertainment, TV hosting. And that's what I was doing when the opportunity to work with just girls came, you know. And that was my choice. When I met that girl, I knew the only way that I would go back into this space was if I was going to create something that I never had because I never had a space, even though I'm in the Gracie family and I grew up in jiu-jitsu schools, there has never been a single studio that I walked in that I looked around. And I was like, wow, they really thought about me when they built this, like this is, I'm supposed to be here. You know, it was always like, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the boys gym, but I'm welcome. It's very different to be welcomed into a male space or to know, wow, this space is made for me. I belong here. And that was my, my reasoning for getting back into it. It was like, okay, if I'm going to work with jujitsu again, I'm going to create something that I've never had. And we're going to wear hot pink geese and we're going to do this our way. And I still get phone calls from family members, you know, asking me, questioning me, why am I wearing pink geese? This is against tradition. And I'm like, you don't understand. And I'm going to keep doing it. You know, it's, it's not a deal breaker for our relationship. I appreciate, you know, the, the feedback, but I welcome the questioning because it makes me think, am I going against tradition? Does that feel wrong for me in any way? And then I go back into my experience. I'm like, no, this is why we're doing this because the hot pink G is a statement that we're going to be here, but we're not going to hide and we're going to make this fun and we're going to lead with love. There's so many symbolisms that are attached to them and it's fun. You look on the mat and you see a group of study girls in hot pink geese. It's a different view, you know, and most of the times for the girls that are coming in for the first class, they only step in because they get to wear the pink gi. And that's the part that, you know, sometimes they don't understand. It's like, if you knew that the pink gi is the only reason why this girl decided to step on the mats and now she's on this journey. It was the only thing that I could use to convince her because she was like, no, I don't want to do this. I'm so intimidated. There's a lot of girls I don't know. I'm like, you get to wear this like super cool warrior suit as hot pink. And then she's like, oh, she never wore anything like this. It's like a superhero costume for her, you know, and she puts it on and it changes how you feel. It's your armor, you know. And ju just think about it. Some days you're like, that's, you put something on, you put your favorite thing and like that changes how you feel. So um, I'm super excited when I get to see that that is the determining factor for them to come in. And then that beca it became our symbolism, you know? I love this. Okay. So you're afraid of heights. They'd even run you in Canyon a couple of times. I don't know, but you get this invitation to to climb Everest in six and a half weeks, which is less than the amount of time you would need to prepare for a marathon. And, and you accepted it. So talk a little bit about how that came to be and, and, and what did you see that as an opportunity for? I am terrified of heights. I'm not scared. I'm terrified of heights. And, um, you know, I, th I have a large networking of athletes, especially in LA, you know, and you just always meet people. And I met, um, I met athletes that were involved in climbing and one thing led to another. And the opportunity came for me to climb Lobosche, which was a mountain in the Kumbu Valley. So I would still do the whole trekking to Mount Everest. 
I would still be on Everest base camp, but then I would climb Low Boucher, which is a total beginner mountain. And I would learn, you know, I would get three days of training in the Kumbu Ice Fall to learn how to, you know, be in altitude and climb technically and all these things. And for that smaller challenge, I took it up as if I was climbing Everest. And that's a really important part of that story. I was like, okay, I'm going to be in altitude. I'm going to be climbing. It's still a super high mountain. 6,120 6, meters is really high. But compared to Everest, it's nothing. So it's all a matter of perspective, right? But I remember that at the time when I decided to take that on, I reached out to the best coach in mountaineering in the world. Michael McCastle has trained several athletes that, you know, have multiple world titles and world, um, uh, world records under their belts. And I asked him to train me for Le Boucher. And I had six and a half weeks to prepare and never done mountaineering. And we start training everything. You know, he takes me on as a client, luckily. And he puts me into a very strenuous training camp that was supposed to last 20 weeks, but 20 weeks, but he comprised it in six and a half. So it was, you know, my training sessions would last three and a half hours a day on average. And I remember throughout the whole camp, I was journaling and I kept writing, you know, writing down all the feelings that I was having about this expedition. And I just knew in my head, I was like, I never go for a lesser summit. And I just couldn't sleep knowing that I was going to be at Everest Base Camp and I was going to climb another mountain, you know? And it was just who I am. I was like, I have what it takes. I was learning all these things. And, and I knew that ultimately in six and a half weeks, if I went all in, knowing myself, I would learn all of the technical, you know, things that I needed for this climb. My body, I was ready. So I would just get stronger. But it's not like I'm starting from scratch. I'm already an athlete. But ultimately, I knew that the differential for me to make it would be my mindset. And I knew I, my mind is strong enough to do this, you know. And so many times I just see, you know, an impossible challenge. And I, you know, I, I think, wow, could jujitsu make me accomplish that thing that is totally outside of the mats? So I was writing down my journal and my coach asked me, you know, the next day, because he would see all my metrics. It was like, oh, you're not sleeping well, so you're not recovering. That's really going to impact our training. And I said, I just, you know, I need to ask you a question. Do you think if I attempt to climb Mount Everest, I'm going to die? And then he said, Sass, I've been training for Everest since day one. I just didn't tell you. And I still get goosebumps every time I tell the story because there was a pause and both of us were like silent on the phone. And I knew exactly what he was thinking. And he knew exactly what I was thinking. Cause we were both like, oh my God, we're going to do this. And, um, and then we did an altitude training camp where he ran all my metrics to make sure, you know, I would be prepared. I wouldn't put anyone's life in jeopardy for being there, for attempting this climb. And then it, it was just, you know, um, full on preparation, get the permits, you know, get ready for this. And not telling anyone because people would tell me I'm crazy. People, you know, every time we want to accomplish big things, be wary of people with small minds. And, you know, I just, I didn't have the time and I couldn't afford the energy of having to deal with people with small minds. And it was like in that moment where I accepted that Everest was the next challenge up in my journey and that I was going to take that on. It was a click in my mind of, Finally, the opportunity I've been looking for my whole life to prove the efficiency of these principles and the power in any environment came. It's in my hands, but it might take my life. Am I willing to bet my life on these principles? Am I willing to show that jujitsu is going to be what's going to take me to the top of the world? And there was only one answer I could give, and it was yes. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Let's just double click on this for a second. So you're on, you're on the trek, right? What does it look like to apply some of these principles 
I heard you mention in another interview, or maybe it was something I read where you said you had to switch your mindset from I'm climbing the mountain to I'm connecting with the mountain. And that made a big difference yeah. in the outcome. What were some of the other principles? What were some of the other experiences maybe with you or the people you were climbing with that kind of made you realize, wow, I've really embodied these principles? Yeah. And the first thing I tapped into was my foundation. And the thing about our foundation light is we have to be brutally honest with ourselves. And that is the most painful part. You can't wish your foundation was something it's not. You have to be brutally honest and say, okay, my foundation is weak on this department. And that's the only way that it will get better. So the first thing for me was, let me look at my foundation and let me be brutally honest with myself so I know what I need to do moving forward in order to be prepared for this. And that's where it all began. And I knew, okay, I have a solid foundation. What do I need to build upon that? And, you know, my connection with myself was so important and managing the distance, even with the people in my expedition, because life is a journey. And that was a 50 day journey to climb Everest. And those are long days. Those are cold days. Those are painful days. And, you know, I've experienced my highest highs and my lowest lows in this expedition. I've been as close to death as humanly possible. And I've been as high up in the world as humanly possible because there's nothing higher. And it's the in-between that you're constantly navigating your connection with yourself, your connection with the mountain, your connection with your team, and, you know, your connection with your mission. Because ultimately... When it comes down to your life being at risk and you deciding if you're going to move forward or if you're going to go back to base camp, it's going to come down to those things being in alignment and being very clear. A couple of things that I've learned that I took from the mountain with me were the small things are the big things. In the mountain, if you lose one glove and you're high enough, you die. The small things are the big things. If you're on your summit push and you pull out your phone and you remove your glove to try and take a photo and that glove falls, your odds of surviving are very low. First of all, you're not going to summit anymore. You have to descend immediately. You're going to get frostbite. You can have hypothermia. There were bodies that were dead and like all they were missing were one glove and they're intact in the mountain. The small things, your energy, your mindset, your self-talk, you have to be extremely efficient with your energy, with your time, with your equipment. Everything needs to be in the right place. You can't lose anything. You need to know time. You know, you, if you're moving too slow, your life can be at risk. There are so many things that matter, but ultimately every little thing that you think you can replace or you can do later or, you know, all those things in life that were like... There, there is no, I can do it later. There is no, oh, I'll get another one. Or I know somebody, let me call them. There is no, I know somebody. You know, you don't know anybody. It's you and you. So and everyone's at their edge, right? Like, it's not like people are just chilling, waiting for you to have problems so they can help you. Yeah, and, and you're pretty much alone. You know, everyone is, is, is worried about their own journey. And everyone is fighting for their lives, which is, you know, it's different than, oh, they're worried about their own journey. They're selfish. No. If they try to take care of you, it's like the oxygen mask in the plane. If they pull your mask on you before they put on them, they're going to pass out and the mask is not attached to you yet and you're both dead. You know, it is what it is. Like you, you need to have that very clear in your mind. And it, it, it's interesting because as you climb higher and higher, you start seeing people crumbling down, right? Like either they get sick, their foundational health is weak. I did, one of the main things that helped me on this climb was I did 20 minutes of breath work every single day because when you're in altitude, your lung capacity decreases. Your lungs stop operating at full capacity, literally. So your capacity to transport oxygen diminishes in the environment when you need this capacity to be as high as possible. You need to be very efficient on how you consume oxygen, your body composition, all these things, you know? So I did 20 minutes of breath work every single day. You know, I already do it at home, but I kept that practice. And the interesting thing was 
as I got high up in the mountain, that practice was painful. Even at base camp, I would wake up every day at base camp out of air. And I would start the breath work. And so many times I was like, oh, I'm not going to do this. This is literally hurting me. Like I'm feeling pain in my lungs and I, as I'm doing all this, you know, these powerful breaths. But whenever I stopped and I was done, I was, I was back on track. I wasn't even feeling the altitude anymore, you know? And I kept and doing you, that you until- You would pray the, too every morning. Yes, I would pray every morning and every step I took, you know, I'd, I would ask for permission from Chamaluma to, to let me continue, you know, um, Everest in Nepalese means mother goddess. Now think about that. Everest in Nepalese means mother goddess. This is the goddess mama in the world. The highest mountain in the world is a female mountain. You know, it, it's a sisterhood. I was walking hands in hands with, uh, with Mama Goddess, and I was asking for permission to continue. And I truly believe in that. I don't do that only on Everest. You know, whenever I'm on a hike, whenever I'm, I'm getting into nature, I ask for permission from the beings who live there. Every time I go surfing, you talked about the white sharks. I, I touch the water before I, I place my surfboard on the water, and I ask for permission from all the beings that live there. It's their home. And, you know, can I visit for a few hours? It's, it's going to be very helpful for me. And, and there were times that I didn't feel welcome that I didn't go in. I'll tell you that when I was surfing, like something feels off and I would just, okay, not today. That's okay. Well, you know, and, and that's how I felt on Everest. There were several things in that expedition that tested my ability to move forward. And, you know, ultimately I, it was so clear to me that I was safe and that I could keep moving forward. And I kept listening to that voice. And when I tell people, oh, jujitsu took me to the top of the world, they think, oh yeah, she's, you know, it's, it's bullshit. Like she's just, you know, uh, she's just saying this, she's trying to tie this into something. I'll tell you this story. So camp four is when the death zone, which they call the death zone begins because there's not enough oxygen to sustain life. So whether you're using oxygen or not, your cells are dying and you can only be there for so long. So when we start the summit push, we start at night, which is going from camp four all the way to the summit. There is a South summit, which is not the real summit. There is Hillary step, which is, you know, just a rocky face with, you know, massive falls on both ends. And then you finally reach the summit and you have heavy gear, you're carrying your own oxygen bottle and you start at night. So you reach the summit early in the morning. So when you start climbing, it's pitch black. All you see those like little light coming from your headlamps and you look around sometimes you're like, Ooh, that's a huge cliff, you know, but you, you didn't see it, but you were walking right by it. And how many times in life we waste so much energy, like looking around and getting so freaked out about all the possibilities of things going wrong that we forget to look ahead. We don't have that luxury on Everest. You have to be stepping forward. You can't stop. You stop, you freeze, you get hypothermia, you're wasting oxygen, you're losing time. You're, you're gonna put your whole expedition in jeopardy and everything you worked for because you're so worried about looking around. So even when you said, you know, what about the other climbers? There's no time to be looking around. And you're just looking forward. You're looking forward and you're looking higher. So when we start climbing, we make strategies with our own team depending on our speed. You know, there is a big question about long queues, long lines on Everest. You can, if you get stuck on a line, that can cost your life or it can cost your summit. So we made the decision to start climbing two hours after everyone. You know, all the teams, all the different teams on Camp 4, they all left at 8.30 p.m. We started putting, you know, our, our boots on at 10.40 p.m. and we took off. So all the lights that I could see looked like stars because they were two hours ahead of me. So when I looked up the mountain, it was all of these like tickling things and they were kind of moving and they're moving at a really slow pace, but you see those lights guiding the way. And it was such a beautiful sighting. It's hard to put into words. You know, I was just looking at that and I was like, wow, these are human stars you know, lighting the path. That is so crazy. It's incredible. So I started climbing and, you know, 
it is one of the hardest parts of the climb. And I'm standing on a ridge, which, ma which made it particularly dangerous. A huge windstorm hits 150 kilometers per hour. And we're just, you know, crouch down, wait. You never know, like, is that going to be it, you know, or can we keep moving forward? So we decide to keep moving forward. And then when it's almost dawn, it's, which is the coldest hour, it's still dark. I look up and one of the lights starts look coming down, starts descending. And it's really scary because it makes you think there's something wrong up there. Maybe the lines are cut, like maybe something happened. And it's not natural that this light is already coming down so soon. I knew something was off. And as the light kept approaching, I saw that it was this woman in my expedition, Danica. And she had been climbing for like 30 years. She had been on Everest Space Camp 20 times. She was a guide. And this was the first time that she was attempting to climb Everest. Now think about this, 20 times on Everest Space Camp. First time she decides to go for it, she summited several other mountains, extremely experienced climber, teaches ice climbing gear. She helped me out a lot at base camp to learn how to do all my knots, to learn how to operate my gear, you know, so I would be self-sustainable in the mountain if I needed. And when I see that she's coming close, I get worried. I immediately look at her, you know, Donica, what's happening? Like, do you need help? Are you hurt? Like, did you, did you have an oxygen malfunction? I immediately think something bad happened. I will never forget what she told me. Like, she looks at me, totally healthy. And she says three things. She said, it's too cold. It's too dangerous. It's not worth it. Oh my gosh. It still pains me to think about the interaction that I had with her. I tried everything I could in the short amount of time to convince her to keep going up with us. But that mindset, when the stakes are that high, is impossible to change because she's stuck in a mindset of self-sabotage. And that is the difference between an experienced climber that has been climbing for 25 years, coming down 250 meters from the summit, and me, who never climbed a mountain before, making it to the summit and coming back down safely. It was purely our mindset. So you don't need to climb Mount Everest to understand the importance of having a strong foundation, of having a good connection with yourself and being connected with your environment, and then leveraging all your skills in the moments that matter the most. That's why I'm so passionate about these principles, because it's on the final, not 20, it's on the final 2% that you don't make it for something you've worked your whole life. It's been to Nepal 20 times. You're 250 meters from the mountain. You're perfectly healthy. You're made for this. And you're coming back down because you are sabotaging yourself. And that's something I would never do. I might put myself at higher risk than I should, but you know, I've been that woman though. I've sabotaged myself in other situations. And you know, now I see the importance of this, and that's why I'm so passionate, because the only way that we get to live the lives that brings us fulfillment and joy and happiness and that allows us to go through hard lessons and come out on the other side instead of succumbing to drugs, to depression, to medication, to opioids, to, you know, suicide, to destructive behaviors, is when you have those things sustaining you. And it became so clear to me when I was there looking at her, and in my heart I could only think, wow, I wish I had met her earlier we would probably make it, you know? And also for you, again, in your mind, you have this massive why, right? Which I think can also make a difference. You have all these girls who are looking up to you, who are going to potentially hear about this story. And I'm sure you, you also had maybe your own fears, your own doubts, because you're human, but you were able to leverage that larger why to stay connected to, to the purpose and to keep relying on your foundation, which is your training, right? Learning how to put boots on when your hands were freezing and make rope knots and all kinds of stuff as contingency plans. So I think, I think that uh, that deserves mentioning as well, that it's your why that really can get you through those hard times because anything worthwhile is going gonna, 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 gonna to be hard and we're going we're gonna to get taken to our edge. Definitely. And, you know, I think the legacy is an important aspect where it's like I'm continuing the legacy. But in those moments, all you think about is your present why, because we don't do things for the past. 
we do things for the present and what that present can generate for the future. So to your point, I was absolutely connected to the girls and they were all cheering me on. They were all sending me messages. You know, the moms would send me videos of them with like, they bought a bunch of books, kids books about Everest. They knew everything, you know, and, and they had so many questions when I came back, but ultimately it was just to show them that it's possible. But how can I be worthy of, you know, standing up every day there and, you know, telling them, hey, I'm going to teach you something that's going to be useful for you in life. And ultimately, you know, I'm going to teach you about life through jujitsu. If I am not putting myself in the same place, you know, every day when they walk in, a lot of girls, you know, when it's their first class, they're crying, they're nervous, they don't know me, they don't know anything. And I'm asking them to be brave. I'm asking them to use their voice. I'm asking them to stand up from the inside. I'm asking them to act as champions. I'm asking them to respect their moms, to look at the moms in the eye when they're served breakfast and say, thank you. I'm asking them to be intentional. I'm asking them to stand up for themselves. I'm asking them to show up even when they don't feel like it. How can I ask them all these things and not do the same? It's unrealistic, right? So I have a very honest relationship with my students, which is everything I ask of you, you can be sure I'm doing it. Because so many times we ask things from people without going through what we're asking from them. And it's unfair because if we actually knew what it takes to do what we're asking of them, we might reconsider or we might be more understanding or we might be more firm and say, hey, I just did it. You know, it's totally doable. You know, get on it. Talk about the idea of invisible contracts. Should we, should, should we have invisible contracts? How do we create invisible contracts? What's an example of an invisible contract? Yes. Um, so invisible contracts are the ones that we sign with ourselves without telling anybody. And invisible contracts are unnegotiable. They're non-negotiable, right? So the invisible contracts that we sign with ourselves are non-negotiable and there are no witnesses. And those contracts can enlighten you or they can consume you if they're not fulfilled. And I do believe that in face of, you know, big challenges or big decisions, whenever I make a decision to change force, course correct, to commit to something, if it's really meaningful, I sign an invisible contract with myself. And that was one thing that I did on Everest. I signed an invisible contract with myself that no matter what happened, as long as I was breathing, as long as I was moving, and as long as I was conscious, I would keep moving forward. Because I knew I was entering a challenge that there's no way I could grasp the immensity of what I was about to undertake. And had I not signed that invisible contract with myself, I would have probably turned around because, you know, I had no idea I was going to get caught in, in an avalanche. I had no idea I was going to fall, you know, into a crevasse. I had no idea I was going to, you know, almost have a deadly fault in the Hillary stab. There were so many things that happened that were out of my control. but. I would go back into that invisible contract and I would just, am I breathing? Am I moving? Is, can I actually walk? Can I make decisions? Then I'm moving forward. It's non-negotiable. And whether you're on the verge of making a course correct in life, whether you're on the verge of committing to something, if it's something that is truly meaningful for you, if you found like, you know, either you're in a place where you know you need to course correct, otherwise you're not going to last much longer, whether it's your health, whether you are in an abusive relationship, you know, when you make that invisible contract and you sign it, there's no way back, right? And it's important to have those contracts in situations where you know there will be things that might make you want to quit or that might make you want to fall back into your old patterns. But it's your agreement that you are, you're going to rise up. And I like to use invisible contracts in moments that I've decided I need to rise up. Where I am is not working, you know, and I need 
serious change, it's, it's you know, an invisible contract can go a long way. Beautiful. Thank you so much for articulating that. And if I'm a parent and I have a daughter or I know a young woman who would, could use some exposure to someone like you, how, how, uh, how, how could that, how could we make that possible? For now, come visit my school in LA, in Los Angeles. And, you know, I am in the process of, um, developing a digital platform because I've been getting a lot of requests, you know, and, and I do know that it's difficult for people to be in LA, especially on an ongoing situation. You know, we don't completely change in one hour. So hopefully January, February, we'll be launching uh, an online platform where they can do live classes with me online. So you can start learning from wherever you are, you know, but um, come visit or connect with my YouTube, my Instagram, just, you know, there, I, I post lessons there all the time. And even if you're not exactly practicing them, at least it's creating awareness on, you know, how you can handle certain situations. But yeah, if you can just, just come visit for now, you know, before the end of the year and, and it comes with a decision, right. But ultimately I think parents need to sign invisible contracts with themselves that they're going to empower their daughters no matter what, even if their daughters don't want it, right? Because we tend to reject the things that we needed the most because they're the most frightening sometimes, you know? So I do think that parents need to step into the role of sturdy leaders. You know, Dr. Becky Kennedy talks a lot about this. I implement a lot of her things in my program and some things are non-negotiable with your kids and you're not here to necessarily make them happy. You're here to provide the things that are the best for them. And they'll thank you later. I promise you there are so many things that I thought when I was a kid, including being forced to do jujitsu and to, you know, eat healthy and being forced to serve watermelon juice on my birthday parties. And I thought that was so embarrassing. And soda was never allowed in my house, you know, and even when I said, but my friends are coming over and they all drink Coke and you just have it for one day. I'm not going to touch it. And they're like, no, why would I offer poison for them if we don't take poison ourselves? You know, why would I offer something that is damaging for them if we don't do it? So be the example at home, like be honest, allow, allow them to question you because that will make you grow and step into the role of leaders. Don't let your kid decide what they're going to do. This is why you're a parent, right? You're a parent to guide them because you know better, because you have more life experience and they will thank you later. I love that. Awesome. Well, I could keep going on and on, but we have to end sometime and, and I'll just have to bring you back so we can talk more about uh, philosophy and principles and, and, and whatnot. But thank you so much for uh, being so open in your share and we'll put links to everything that we discussed in the show notes so that people can find their way to you and looking forward to this platform being created. And also you need to write a book too. I don't know if you're working on a book right now, but you have book written all over your story. <laughs> so I'm working on that's it. That's something that's in the, in the in process as well. I'll have a, a separate call with you to, to get some advice from you and what's the best way to move forward with that. I've been getting this request so much so. Yeah, you need that. It's the world, I should say, we need it. We need to learn more from you in book form. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.